Okay.
Hava now. Okay. So starting from the beginning because turns out I was not recording. Uh, so today we are discussing Void Heart Symphony, uh, a game by Ufo Press, uh, by the owner of the company, so by Jay Isles. She is one of the most interesting designers uh, for Powered by the Apocalypse. Her lineage of games uh, of World of Legacy are some of my favorite games uh, within the uh, Powered by the Apocalypse uh, Dynast, let's say, uh, and today we're going to be doing uh, a study session that uh, we can learn together the, the intricacies of the game. We are not here exactly to go to a breakdown of the rules, because the philosophy of these study sessions is that you're going to screw up. Uh, everyone screws up their first time running the game. Okay, nobody expects that. You're gonna screw up the second time you run the game. The third time you can run the game. The fourth time you run the game. You're playing a game for months and months and it's still gonna be surprising you. And that's okay. Uh, the question is, you close yourself to learn the game if you don't get a base understanding of the game. If you don't understand what the rules uh, want to evoke, what is the mood of the game? How can you actually be a fan of the players? How can you collaborate to build the story? And which tools the game presents to you? So the, the idea behind these study sessions is to go overall to get some five key points which will allow you to run your first session with as much permission as you can to screw it over because there will be these five elements that are true to the idea of the game to the experiments that the game wants to create that you can play around you can improvise you can use rules of other games but as long as you stay to those you are giving your players the experience that they expect and you also are putting yourself in a position in which you can actually learn from the game and discover how you yourself can actually play the game better so we are not here to to teach anyone we are here to learn different points in which we can individually improve that is the idea behind these study sessions and the reason why i pick the void heart symphony is threefold First of all, uh, World of Legacy is a family of games that has a reputation of being extremely complex and difficult to get into, even for people that are used to play Power by the This is the reputation is mostly uh, over uh, over expressed. It mostly comes from the different. Uh, Story structure that it tends to have compared to other PBTA games. Uh, and we're gonna go open that later, and especially something that we're gonna go back on the final points and conclusion uh, of the study session. Uh, second part is that, uh, in fact, I was pretty sure that this was already the first, the final version of the rules. Turns out actually that uh, J. Alves is uh, she is still working on um, on the real fun, final version. But from what I prepared already in advance for this study, I think we can at least get the fundamentals for our first session of Void Art Symphony from the rules as they are. And this actually fits us pretty well because we don't intend to go way too deep into the rules. And the third one is, well, I really like what this game uh, wants to do. It, it is a game about teenage uh, reality. It is a game uh, of urban fantasy, of going into uh, a supernatural domain, but at the same point is a game that acknowledges the, the material conditions it acknowledged that uh, uh, young people, they are constrained not only by the positions in which they are, that uh, they are projected into them on reasonable expectations, 
while not being the, given the means to seize it, open them, while at the same time uh, there is this omnipresent uh, uh, poison of uh, neoliberalism ideas that kills imagination and the element of supernatural actually evokes the the idea of in blooming through the 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 illusions of uh, capitalism breaking through the end of uh, history mentality and by extrapolating beyond what is real is capitalism realism in which everyone is immersed on these young people are actually able to in exchange and that uh, they are able to reinforce their own connections to others that have been alienated. I think there is very strong potential for very powerful uh, gameplay, for very powerful fiction uh, that can be created between players that I think this game does a lot to explore. And of course, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, the Shin Megami Tensei series and the game draws a lot from them uh, and as a bonus point uh, for every step forward that Atlus and other similar companies do forward they tend to do two back and they can be very reactionary and regressive on their games and this is actually a very open inclusive uh, take on those types of fiction and is honestly the kind of uh, intersectional gameplay that we want to see. The, we, we will only do better if we have more games with Void Heart. So, usually, the first thing that we start analyzing is what this game is about. So, a priori, we know uh, two things it's a Power Dwarf the Apocalypse game. And it is a world of legacy game. Now, for anyone familiar with uh, either of those, that immediately conjures uh, an image, uh, even if it's pretty meaningless for other people. The game does a great job in explaining itself and selling its premise. And immediately from the blurb, the game sells itself very clearly. And I think this is actually a good, uh, a good template to what a game should be, how a game should shell itself, how a game should establish tone, expectations, and uh, how to actually put uh, everyone at the table on the same level as the conversation. Just from the introduction of the game, and uh, the blurb that establishes the premise, uh, Void Heart Symphony leaves pretty clear what the game is about and in, in breaks it down into three important pieces of information. Don't need to read through the book. Immediately, these three paragraphs tell you everything that you need to know. we are immediately told that the game is cooperative that it's storyline so even people that are new to the role-playing games know what they are going to do uh they tell you what your characters are you are playing rebels someone that has seen something that the fiction immediately established as the castle and this castle seems to be an invading force spreading through their city and lending occult power to predatory vessels. You, players, have decided to fight them. To fight them. You struggle, but on the process, you get infected by the same void that empowers the castle. Then, it established that the gameplay so after explaining who you are as a player, what are your characters, and what is their struggle, immediately it tells you what you are expected to do on this game. Which is very important. A lot of the games they say what you are playing as, 
and they kind of fiddle around what exactly the game is about and what, what you actually end up doing during most of the game. Uh, out of my mind, two examples come out. Uh, for example, a Vampire the Masquerade uh, or any of uh, the Vampire lineage, you know, you play a vampire, it's supposed to be about, you know, the duality between beast and man and how to live as an undead creature probably in the night. But then, the game does not really say how you play that. And instead of that, you are tempted to just be a dark superhero. You have all these cool games and uh, these cool combat abilities and the game keeps telling you, hey, hey, why don't you just with these cool powers? Yeah. Uh, while, for example, the fiction basically reduces it to be, well, you are all a bunch of uh, superpower beings and are fighting each other to become the ruler of the city. Uh, and the game is not exactly open, well, most of the times, it's not exactly open in what you are and you actually play. So this is very important because this paragraph establishes immediately what the game is and how it will be played. The game gonna unfold through investigations. The castle invades the city. It's starting to enact change. And it is empowering vassals. And those vassals are going to try to exploit the people in the city, establish hierarchies, and create this feeding machine that just takes all that is good, worth, wealthy, in the world and siphons it to the vassals, to the castle, and to feed the unending greed and appetite of the void. The rebels, the players, you need to fight out against this invasion. And you start by learning what you can, finding the identity of the vassal, finding exactly what their domain inside the castle is, and striking back. And eventually this is supposed to settle in a cycle. So you go investigation, you go into the castle, you try to connect yourself with the city, with the people that you know, try to recover, try to get new powers, try to deal with the connection with the void, there's a new investigation, you go back and forth, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the game, uh, actually, the blurb tells you a pretty good job, not only telling what the, the game says the game is about, and what, what about the text of the game actually says it. This is, that those two things are pretty much synonymous in this case is why I consider this such a well-written game. And JL tends to do that on every uh, legacy game. Uh, probably the one that is not as concise has to be uh, Legacy Life Among Ruins, mostly because of how many different directions you can take that game. And even that, there are three key frameworks. But uh, there is very good introduction. In fact, the game does a great job at teaching yourself uh, how to play it. The game, the game has a, a very well-planned setup. You, can, you don't need to fully complete your characters. And you immediately start fighting one of the vassals in the castle. So you immediately start with a strong opening, teaches you everything that you need to about combat, and involves you with the vassal as someone that has hurt each of you in different ways, gives you guidelines of how to create the first a vassal, and puts you back immediately. So the very first session, before you have any uh, any choices about your characters lock on while you are still learning the system the game does an excellent job guiding you and introducing key elements 
whenever they are necessary. This assures that you're gonna not be at loss to what to do next in the first session, which already relieves a lot of the weight if you are running the game. Uh, which leaves you to focus on the things that you can screw up, namely in terms of tone, interpretation of uh, what is exactly the vibe that the game is going for, how the game mechanics favor certain experience, and how can you reinforce them, and so on and so on and so on. So, the game is actually making our, our first point very easy. Uh, and usually, uh, one has to dig a bit more into the game to actually get a notion of how the game plays, what you are supposed to do. Uh, so, we kind of can go a bit wild. And we go into the text, uh, we go into the moves. Uh, this is a PBTA game, so as you expect, it's dri uh, driven mostly by moves. For those not familiar with PBTA games, uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion of exactly makes a PBTA game. A lot of people believe that it's taking the game as an ongoing conversation, uh, that it's the move system, that it's organizing the game by playbooks, that it's the strong focus in team and gen. Uh, to be fair, everyone is writing its own way. But uh, indeed, it's a common thing among many part by the Apocalypse game that you have moves. And the analogy between uh, between moves is that they are basically uh, that they are basically the way through which you interpret the fiction. So it is a common case of the of the of uh, Power of the Apocalypse game that that your intent on your actions uh, of your characters, that the fiction opposition is ultimately the big imperative. And you're just narrating what your character does, what goes in their minds, what they try to accomplish with the way that they act. And this outcome is decided ultimately by a move. That's how a lot of the basic move ideas of Power by the Apocalypse work with different games taking different approaches to to moves one thing for example you're gonna see some of the moves that we have here and we're not gonna lose a lot of time basically you have Two classes of moves. You have moves that you use in the city, which uh, we're gonna go back at this again, but basically these are moves in which you are kinda draw into anonymity. It's this weird consumer based identity which you are pretty much living anonymous lives in which everyone else could be living your lives. Uh, and that's why part of establishing your identity is on the acts of rebellion. Uh, and in this case, it's not your character, what they can do or what they cannot, that really matters. It's not their skill, it's not their learning. It's the restrictions of society imposed of them. And basically every mundane moves, uh, mundane moves, there is the burden and stresses that society place upon you. And whenever you do a mundane move, you are struggling with such pressures. Uh, 
you have different sources of stress, which can go into detail later, which are basically blood, lack, infamy, heat, and filthy, which represent different ways in which society can limit your capacity to act. And whenever you want to do something, there will be a move that establishes an appropriate response. For example, if you want to be unnoticed when you're doing something illegal or you're just trying to not draw attention to yourself, uh, you try you narrate what your character does and you try to pass beneath notice. So you will check against uh, infamy. You're gonna pick two D sixes. You're just gonna roll them, and if you roll above your infamy, fine. Your infamy is not so much that actually hampers it. But if you fail, you can get either a he uh, quit or a, or a miss completely. And usually a weak hit is going to put you on a, a situation that is complicated or let you succeed with the cost. Or, or while a strong hit usually gives you what you want at the top problem. Miss tends to put you in a worse position than before because it opens you to a reaction by the game master. And that's when the castle or the city strike back at you. And we have a bunch of, of moves built around that philosophy for mundane moves. Then we have castle moves. Castle moves are the opposite. While on the city moves, you are constrained by the, by the perspectives of society uh, and literally anyone else that will be put on your life and on the same pressures will be subjected to those and their chances of success pretty much depend entirely on that. Castle moves are about how you are as an individual, how capable you are and how do you perform within the castle. These tend to be uh, more familiar to exploration or combat moves. Uh, these use your skills, which they are going to be swords, wands, coins, and cups. Uh, and basically, they determine how well you fight, how well you find things, how you navigate the castle, uh, and so on and so on. So basically, you the moves overall divided in these two phases. You have the moves that uh, everyone shares that uh, are shaped by your limitations and you have the castle moves that allow you to use your skills on the castle so that you can use the power of the void to uh, change the castle and draw it open yourself, perhaps even to change the material conditions back in the city. Or at the very least, to stop the vessel. And I was going into this uh, tour about the moves because I wanted to talk about what to me I found is the what the game is really about. So we know we have these two moves. We have these two cycles of play between city and castle. And you are playing rebels, you're stopping the invasion of the castle and you're facing off against vassals, all while trying to survive, to stay healthy and to not let your mental health deteriorate under the constant assault of neoliberal nightmares. So, are you stuck on this system? You're always going to be investigation, reacting when the castle comes back? No. There is a key moment. Whenever you defeat a vassal, when the true power and true way in which players actually have agency to create significant change, 
And it's a very special move that is activated when you defeat Vassal in the desert. Rivers in the desert. Me, this is what the game is about. Everything in the game is so that you can constantly activate this move. Everything you do is with the eyes on this price. You suffer the indignities of the city. You establish new connections. You fight vassals. You delve into the castle. Because rivers in the desert, you can bridge through the limitations imposed by you. You can seize power and in a very focal way use the inherent violence of this power to force change. And of course, this is not without issues. So let's go through this move, uh, move that I consider the core element of the game, what everyone is chasing. And whatever you, when you are game mastering, you should be keeping this as what you are ultimately leading your players to, that they don't end up frustrated or lose themselves in the constant grind of life on the late stage capitalism. When you defeat Vassal's avatar, the power they've gathered is yours to control, to bring new life to this city. You, based on your connection to the void, take turns choosing. You can reform the vassal. They admit their role in the exploitation of their fellow, of the fellow people. The, they will step down of the hierarchy system that they have and they will make reparations for what they damage during the investigation. This protects you from uh, retaliation from the, from the castle as they are their focus distracted between yourselves and the vassal turned turn cold. You can focus in urban renewal. So the castle is gonna be constantly screwing over with your city, and it's always, always, always gonna hurt the most the people that are on the most fragile conditions. It will always be the marginalized folks, it will always be the poor, it will always be the unseen masses, it will always be the workers that are going to be mostly hurt by the hierarchy uh, and weird dark feudalism that the vassals and the castle create. So you can use rivers in the desert to strike back. You can pick a neighborhood of the city and Describe how you push the castle off of it. How you bring new opportunities into the place. How the community regains control of their livelihood. How, how a black block rises. How uh, people gain more control of ownership of their workplaces. All small things in which common wisdom or the way of the world or that's just not how things are done have poorly served. You repel the influence of the castle and the people are able to live in new meaningful ways. And the benefit that you get from this is that you develop new connections or further your own connections within the city. So reinforcing the sense of community instead of remaining alienated from the world as you were on the precarious conditions that you started. And you start to build a base of solidarity. You can always invest in healing. This removes a long-term affliction, be it you know, social, economic, physical, spiritual, etc. From you or one of your connections. Uh, 
and this gives you a bit more selfish approach from that but it's still ultimately about deepening relationships and assuring that the people that you care about are able to survive on hellish reality you can be even more selfish and you can expropriate you rising station you use the power of the castle so that uh, uh, you improve your own lot in life I mean, it can, this can be seen as a bit of being a class traitor, as you know, as you sacrifice the raw potential of the workers of a liberated or urban renewal place or a covenant that is healed, and instead of uh, using that to bring new life, you see that in a selfish. Again, so might see you as a class traitor. You might just see it as a poor mobility or, you know, my ability to do well in life is going to be affecting how I face the castle and that is going to have better replications for everyone it's going to tickle down and so on and so on and so on you can sell the fiction as you want and the question is if you, you are able to convince others and more important if your character is able to convince themselves and live with this you can also expand your base of operation so uh, basically it, this is a more specific version of urban renewal in which basically you you are a home turf you are improving it and basically instead of having new ties you have different amenities that are going to be used by you or your contacts or the neighborhood you can also an encounter you know, a connection that uh, you don't know or you want to know better they will just appear on your safe haven and reveal their true nature which is good if you are at loss of more people maybe for the next uh, investigation you want to widen out your reach so this is also a good option now all those things that have benefit uh, probably some are better on certain situations some are more selfless and more selfish than others there's always a price you are drawing from the from the power of the castle more precise from the power of the void from the dark and tropic forces that surrounds the world and just resists to drain everything of world from you draw this power you reinforce your connection to the void and it raises in rank and the first thing that this is gonna do is gonna make you less loyal to other rebels and that vessel that you stole the power from is permanently sealed away from the power of the cut for good or for ill and it could be advantageous to have a reform in the vessel to once again tap into these energies but that possibility is now gone so this is ultimately what you're gonna do gonna risk yourself risk hurt and violence in social physical mental economic form against yourself and the city against your connections your covenant you're gonna brave the castle you're gonna slowly grow more and more connected to the void and ultimately you stop the bastard that is ruining your city one last servant of the castle and you take its power and you will not change but ultimately receiving that power changes you and brings you closer to the void so the question is how much power can you take and how willing are you 
from relinquishing and abdicating of his power. So this dynamic, chasing the rivers in the desert, going to create this conflict between seeking power, which is very common in role-playing games, and abdicating power. And rivers in the desert is the most obvious example, it's ultimately the pinnacle, but there are a lot of simple structures across the game that reinforce is duality so if you are running your first game you just go through the guidelines that that were written for us you just go this simple set of seven steps and we have a great first session we familiarize ourselves with most of the rules we try half of the moves or so perfect but if we are already aware from the beginning of this duality that everything on the game invokes about seeking power to depose and absorb the vassals, but the consequences of yielding these powers and the ultimate test of the virtue of abdication, we can create pretty early on lamp shading future decisions, future dilemmas, and future challenges. So this is always very good to even during the early sessions to start establishing these conflicts and dilemma. I think that if you, if you internalize this basic conflict that there is on Void Heart Symphony, you're gonna create very satisfying uh, game experience even if you don't interact with most of the subsystems of the game, and, or even if you take a long time to actually try the different rules. So, we pretty much uh, find out with this what the game is about. So, the next question is, would be what is the game engine so we're gonna open the hood of the game and try to understand how the game keeps itself running now the game is pretty well designed and has a very good understanding of how to transmit its idea and if you see the game as a conversation, uh, it's pretty clear what it wants to do. You should be talking, I play describes an action. Uh, the fiction establishes a course. Uh, so if the fiction, uh, fiction leaves pretty clear what should happen, then that happens. Then we ground uh, the results on the fiction and we go back into the conversation. If the outcome is not so clear, if this is something that the fiction still has not established, we ask ourselves if this is something that the move would solve. We go through the moves, mundane, castle moves, special moves from uh, different playbooks, is there anything that would fit this? Yes, then we solve the move. We roll the dice or not as needed. We make the choices. We can spend or get hold. That's based more on economies of the game, which we will not be getting into the study session. Is the kind of things that you don't mess, need to mess up on the first sessions. And you can learn on your pace and maybe find your way to handle it. You ground the result in fiction and you go back. So on the first session, we're probably going to solve a lot of things just on not being a move or uh, if it does not have reper uh, repercussions. Of course, the main limitation here is that even if there's probably a move, you are still learning the game, you might not be aware of all the moves for every situation. So that's okay. 
as long as you keep an eye out to any move that would really fit that. And the good thing is that the primer that uh, for the first uh, session and the first encounter with the vassal is pretty good at establish which moves to use when. So even this step, which is often one of the bottlenecks when playing a PBTA game, especially more uh, heterodox ones, uh, is when it's a case for a move or not, that part is pretty easy by those guidelines. So that's doing play. That's the conversation. That's the back and forth. And uh, then the game, the other engine is the more meta one. So this is the cycle of play that you're going to be going through. Uh, the game master is going to introduce the vaso. Uh, an investigation is going to start. Uh, players going to go around. They're going to try to uh, find things about the vessel. And as things happen, the clock of the vessel starts filling. The clock is basically uh, how close the vessels are to start implementing their plan, spreading their influence. And basically, they get to strike back at the players or at the city. And if it feels... Darkness falls, basically uh, it was a victory for the castle and then there will be a downtime before a new investigation starts. So it's going to be a loss for the city and for the rebels. But on the process, while the fight is still undecided, uh, the rebels, they can f go into the castle they can fight the different minions and enforcers of the of the vessel, try to find uh, what is their core of power within the castle, to get tokens, uh, basically symbols of, uh, of, uh, of affection, of uh, connections that they have to the world, of their own personality, or just very central symbols of their identity and gather them so that you can use them back against um, the vassals you can probe their strengths in the mundan world you can see how the castle influences their uh, their modus operandi you can check what exactly the, they they wanted even before they came into contact with the castle what are their mundan resources how well connected they are to the figures of authority and so on and so on uh, and you can just take a break and tend to the mess in your own life which is something that is gonna always keep happening as you are again still living during neoliberal late capitalist nightmare so there's always bills to pay there's always obligations that you have every single element of your time has to be monetized or useful to a third party in some way and so on and so on and so on so you always have that pressure this is going to get you away from the two actually more useful for the investigation one but as is that happening and as the clock keeps filling you keep going investigations and when you are ready you fight the vassal as long as their clock still is not full and you fight the vassal you're gonna defeat them uh, and you're gonna do papers in the desert and then you're gonna have a downtime as there is some peace as the castle weakens until there's a new vassal coming and you must start the cycle over and over again so this is the engine of the game and as you can see it's a very procedural uh, engine basically you have the conversation and the investigation cycle is going to guide most of uh, of the basing but this system is often reinforced it's not for example like blades in the dark has a very linear system 
you do a job downtime the job downtime the job downtime and here in this case it blurs a lot because you have no overall urgency other than the clock so a lot of things that would otherwise be uh, downtime uh, they can help you during the investigation you can take breaks from exploring the castle you don't have to explore the castle at a single time you can find minions at different times you can keep coordinating between the mundane investigations and more exploration etc etc so you have a lot of uh, of um, freedom in this structure and the reason why the game is designed this way is because of the confidence that the game has on its secondary and tertiary ways to nudge you to that direction and this is what really shows JL's brilliance because she does not have a single framework to keep you going back to that no you have a lot of things that feed into that first of all is the specter of scarcity or our oppressors dictate the terms of rebellion because of the ways that moves work in the city which you are limited not by what you are capable to do but by the constraints that society imposes upon you they are setting the terms of the ways in which you have to fight them basically society inflicts violence upon your character and that violence establishes the means through which they can strike back at this unjust hierarchy. So this manifests as stresses. Uh, again, you're gonna have these different stresses, and you're gonna keep getting it inflicted open you as you try to fight off against the castle as you keep investigation or just the attrition of suffering through your life that's going to happen over and over and you're going to be constantly tested on those and this gonna push you to go faster in the investigation you need to get this done or, e or otherwise, it's going to push you into projects. And if you push into projects, you start to find ways to cope it. And you get either uh, progressive uh, projects, which try to give you an edge, something that can help you. Or you can do a defensive project. Basically, because the society is constantly attacking you, attacking your stress, attacking your needs, you prevent yourself and those dear to you and your community from the worst of the harm. And these things, even these projects, they are constantly over attack. And you're going to be suffering the effect of the green. Every time investigation starts, even if everything was fine, there's always a way that capital is going to extract a little edge off of you. Just a bit more. And that is going to keep attacking you here. So apparently you only have the you only have the pressure of the cloth of the vassal. But uh, you actually have all this stress that you're going to be trying to resist uh, on a system that is very reminiscent of Spire and Iron Sword, but it says it's very good twist and basically you're going to be always uh, trying to outrace these, trying to lower them whenever possible. Again, one of the ways that you can do this is rivers in the desert. And you get rivers in the desert if you defeat a vessel. So you have another incentive to go into that. Then we have the actual mess in the castle, which gonna hit you hard. You're gonna get shot. Uh, and whenever you get shot, you get shot, uh, shadow. And whenever you get shadow, you get 
fuller powers. You get stronger, but you also get a stronger connection with the castle. But you also risk getting hurt more and more. If you, you risk keeping those wounds after you leave from the castle to the real world. So, if you push yourself through the castle blindly, because you are pressured in the real life to do so, you're going to be risking that. But you have to do that, because the ways you can do manage this are also related to rivers in the desert. So, this keeps going on and on and reinforcing you. So, even if you have this procedural element, which you should keep in mind, you don't need to enforce this at all. You just need to recognize that this is what everything on the game feeds out it. This is what I consider an example of intuitive, simplistic, redundant design that knows very well the type of stories it wants to create, makes very clear to everyone at the table and everyone reading the book that this is what the game is about and again pushes this race for this structure and ultimately pushes the same dualism between seizing power and abdicating power and the transformations that you can enact while you are holding to that power but ultimately acknowledging that this power does not belong to yourself and the constant reminder to that is the void. The void is the one bad connection on the game. Uh, you have different connections to the game, which we're gonna go on the later point. Uh, and the void is the only bad one. Whenever you draw from the power of the castle, or the rivers of desert, when you sacrifice the well-being of someone uh, while calling to the void, you're going to increase your void. And this is going to mess you up. You're going to gain quickly a lot of black marks in fealty. So you're going to be alienated from your fellow comrades. You're going to lose your connections to the other rebels. And how can you erase this? You give up power and authority willingly, really. So we have a contradiction created by this dilemma that you need power to enact change because society forces you to seek power outside of the paradigm because of the same very same hierarchies it establishes to control you however if you don't do that if you let yourself embrace by the void if you don't learn to appreciate the virtue of abdication and you hoard power and you are not willing to give it up to the, the, to exert the evolution and return that power to the community and the people to which it was stolen from you are becoming more and more alienated from your fellow rebel and from your fellow man ultimately you are going to become uh, just another minion of the castle just another vassal that is perpetuating these unfair hierarchies that keep everyone in chains and keep filling the void. That is how the contradiction inherent to the duality resolves itself. Rivers in the desert, the investigation framework, conversation, and ultimately resolving the relationship between the void and the world. This is the engine of Void Heart Symphony. So we've gone through the engine. 
Now we get one of my favorite parts. I always love to look at the game and try to see, okay, this game is very competent and it does these things very well. It has this goal that proposes itself to do and it has these engines to which it arrives at this goal. But it's not the fun part. I mean, basic competence is the minimum that you can expect from a game. Uh, a good engine is just good design at the end of the day. This comes to my favorite element, which is secret sauce. That thing or things on a game that say, yes, this is why I play this game. Because ultimately, very rarely you play a game because it has a good engine. You scavenge a good engine for the game that you want to play because of the special thing. And this game has the best secret sauce. And we touched briefly on it just when we mentioned the importance of the connections to the city and its people, to those oppressed by the vassals, by the castle, and by the void. I'm talking about Covenant. Covenants are a good way to codify relationships between characters and to codify them in an empowering way. I briefly touched that uh, the, the fact that you have of being constantly coerced and defined in what you can do on your mundane face by the restrictions imposed on society make your character live a kind of anonymous life. Almost like any other character under some situations would live exactly the same life. Covenants, by definition, are a rebellion against that. And they are definitely one of the most interesting elements of the game. And the covenants they are inspired by the major arcana uh, of the tarot which again if you played persona you know exactly what we are talking as you know uh, the persona had different arcana the arcana are the means through which all is revealed etc 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 But when Heart Symphony goes the extra mile, they use the symbology of the Arcana to extrapolate the semiotics and reappropriate them, liberate them. And whenever you establish a covenant, basically you discover a new relationship about another character you will discover another way to see them, which then you codify through the covenant. And this can be a new, uh, new non-player -play character that you encounter, uh, a character that has already been established that you see under a new light, uh, or even a changing relationship, and so on and so on and so on. Every arcana it's basically an archetype of the relationships, of the place they feel on the city and their place, how they relate with the rebellion. And you're going to have different... Uh, you're going to have different ways to interact with your covenants. <laughs> Usually, your covenants, they can offer you succor. Uh, more often than not, they gonna hel need help from you. Uh, they're going to offer conditional information. You're going to have uh, opportunities to improve your relationship with them. And you're going to have uh, opportunities to let them down. All of these are important and all of these are good in fiction. Especially if you let them down, if you are, 
for some reason risking a relationship with a covenant it can cost you relationship but you always get a new memory about your relationship so even that one of the worst uh, outcomes that you can have with the covenant well other than the the vassals and the castle lashing out against them so is going to be one that establishes your relationship and that gives a better idea of what is at stake for the relationship between the characters what is uh at stake for the city uh again uh, you're gonna have moves and fiction and trade-offs that gonna put you in situations which you see your covenants at their best or their worst and you're gonna be more often than not going back and forth between these two and each of them gives you quick guidelines to how this manifests so this immediately creates a two-dimensionality to any character so any npc that you create you already have the basic fictional position that you establish and then you have the role-playing aids that are offered by their covenant so this gives pretty good basis to establish meaningful npc interactions which often are the key for great storytelling so not only you have the two needles to how most interactions should go you also have ways to nurture this covenant basically the things that if you do you're going to increase your relationship or the betrayals the things that if you do you're going to be risking your covenant uh, then you have uh, different moves uh, you have a hangout move which is basically if you are on a downtime or taking a time on your life away from the investigation you know not trying to survive in the city not facing the castle you can hang out with them and each each of them has a different hangout move so if you go to the hanging man you can tell them a dilemma you are facing if you go to that you can ask the uh, they gonna ask you uh, one of three questions and then that allows you to further characterize your character and so on and so on. Each of them has a thing that can happen when you hang out. Having a covenant also opens you extra moves, which is great. More moves mean that you have more options. So you want to have a city move, basically how having these connections on the city makes life under late stage capitalism more bearable or makes investigations easier or maybe bold. And then you have a custom move, how drawing upon your connection to the void and your connection to these people, you are able to weaponize it against the shifting nature nature of the void or the castle or the vessel and this is one of the most important secrets us the the potential of these of these covenants is almost endless you gonna have a lot from juice from a campaign just from these interactions and how they interact with each other and how having this government affects the overall dynamics of the rebellions the raw potential of covenants is overwhelming and it always makes feel that investing on com on, the, on community investing in solidarity investing in others is worthwhile and it's well, it's not it's not even worthwhile. It's 
better reward than anything that the void or the castle can offer you all the lies of the dark feudalism of the void they pale through the to the rewards of establishing true connection or working together to improve one's lot and ultimately you have the two macro covenants we have the world which is basically how much progress you are making in liberating the city how much of the world can breathe easier knowing that the influence of the hierarchies of the castle are gone and you have the void the chains of hierarchy that suck everything to the bone and exploit everyone and that seek to drag you to so this is a great source i'm not lying more games should learn from this and have a system like this uh, this is in many ways is well they are on completely different scales but this is on many ways an evolution of systems like uh, fate which uses aspects or old power tag apocalypse which defines things by tags uh well actually it's to me it's more closer to actually to fellowship because it has a hybrid of two you have aspects that give abilities and you are also defined by the relationship that these characters have with the fellowship and you can also use them so but this is definitely on a completely different scale and between void heart symphony and uh and fellowship any game that does not use a similar system to give a strong presence meaningful interaction and strong support network on a game is missing a lot well a social and community elements are part of the game of course it's kind of the assumption in you making this statement a lot of games care about that and they should not care because it's not the game is it like that's fine it's fine if you want to establish a uh, community if you want to draw to the attention of social networks and support networks this is definitely a game worth studying So, we know what we are here. We are rebels, we are fighting the system, we're gonna be kicking ass to vassals in the castle and inside of it. We're gonna flip the bird to the void even as we seize its power and flip it against them. And we're gonna go through cycles of investigations as we grow in power and we develop the connections that we have with other characters and the city. Are we gonna be hitting those story bits? Well, this is still a part of the apocalypse game. So, an important element of story bits and striking them is what you bring to the table. So, let's start with the, the basic point, which will be the playbooks. So, the playbooks, they show different, uh, different archetypes or types of rebels. The leader, the, the arsonist, the caretaker. The one that is clearly being a shining example of the potential of renewal and what we can do if we are not limited ourselves by the 
the positions of the reality of the city. You can be the the one that is not quite like the others, the one that uh, is more like a mystical creature or a being of the void or a being of the castle or who knows what. Uh, and we have the hacker. Basically, the one that is able to see through the castle, to see to the void, and provide support. And... Hmm. I have troubles defining the icon. In the icon and Arlequin, they are pretty similar. In same way as they are people that rejoice on their role as rebels. The thing is, you have... And this, on a very similar part of the apocalypse and mad manner, it gives you... Oops. Uh, each uh, character has uh, moves that they have on the castle. And they also have a shadow form. Now the shadow form is basically your avatar during the castle, your source of power manifest through the shadows of the void. Uh, and that's basically how you cool, look cool as hell. And you get special moves when you embrace your shadow. But there is another element to the playbook is your role which is basically what you are in the society what is your what are you tied to how do you relate with the rest of the rebels which covenant are you so you already start to take in these archetypes and your place in the world at the same time that you get the placing the team through your archetype and you also have your mundane life which uh, establishes what you are lacking and all of these they have three basic categories of roles each of them has different vocations uh, and you have three types you have delinquents prodigals and traitors uh, this is not very intuitive coming outside of the game uh, but uh, delinquents are usually younger people they are usually in high school between 15 and 25 years old and what they struggle with is that they have no agency uh, everyone keeps telling them what to do how to live their lives uh, which norms to follow for them to achieve any success uh, whenever they try to act outside, uh, like say protesting against climate change, they are told that they should be in school. Whenever they try to uh, learn a trade or to follow their vocations, they are told to get something employable, to learn how to code, etc. So basically, the thing that they struggle the most is having agency on their life. Their lives are constantly surveilled and they have problems carrying their own niche. For the girls, they are not as limited uh, because in a way nobody cares about them. These are usually young professionals or older students uh, where their limitation is me. Basically the world the organization that was created by this hierarchy, be it mundane or by influence of the castle, has no place for them other than to exploit them. So they are always struggling to make ends meet. So their own limitation is providing for themselves. And this is going to be the biggest limitation imposed on prodigals. Traitors, they are usually older, established people. Uh, they are told to lay down and that they're gonna get some scraps off the table. And unlike prodigals, 
for them it actually worked and traitors basically they are able to make do even get some comfort uh, uh quiet lives but their lack is their uh, inability to feel empathy to the to the experiences of others that uh, you know to believe blindly on the system as it works to look aside to injustice basically an overall lack in solidarity so they must struggle in developing class consciousness and to connect with the other rebels but overall they don't they are relatively comfortable compared to the other rebels but they must resist more than perhaps any of the others the allure of just accepting the system as it is and letting the void take them so still may not be very intuitive I created this mnemonic for me to focus myself basically there are three roles zoomers millennials and gen xers zoomers are the delinquents there's really no space to the world for them everyone has an opinion of what they shall do they shall respect their elders and just wait until it's their turn on once everything is doomed then we have the prodigals they are the millennials they are the unwanted there is no space for them in the economic or social uh, framework all the structures that they they were sold when growing up that they would be there for them that they saw their parents benefit from they are just gone they need to risk everything on their life they are always within risk of losing whatever meager existence they have then we have the gen xers the traitors they still manage to get some of the comforts of baby boomers uh, they occupy middle positions that some of them are quite wealthy some of them have managed to do well and on average they are protected from many of the troubles that seem to be burned by the younger generations so they have a lot of incentives on keeping the system working so this three mnemonic help put the coordinates of your characters both in the modern social dynamics and intergenerational conflict and also on the uh, economic realities of the challenges face it again delinquents have problems exercising their own agency uh, prodigals have problems making do with the little resources they have and traitors they have problems in criticizing the system and uh, uh, contesting its uh, unfair hierarchies on the behalf of others <sighs> and already this puts your coordinates pretty clear as part of uh, creation you're going to be establishing locations on the city relevant to your role for example if you are a lawyer you might for example make the corporate building for which you work for on the a legal team or a small practice that you do or a courthouse or where you spend most of the time uh, and so on and so on and so on so already this is going to keep very strong bits immediately open character creation and from that it's it's still a pvtda game so let's have principles and these are really good principles for the mood that the game seeks to inspire uh, there is the two strings of tension and catharsis when you are in the city there's always the rising tension the increased influence of the the castle the way which uh, the city and the wheels of capitalism seek to grind you to dust so we have this increased tension and then you break through and you go into the castle you seize power you enact change and you get catharsis to build up of tension during investigation release tension during rivers in the desert accumulate tension 
in the investigation, <laughs> release tension in rivers of the desert. Always rowing these two elements of the game. Of course, another very important uh, principle is to begin and end with the fiction. When you trigger a move, it's because the fiction dictates. And when you resolve the move, you should end up back into the fiction. Because you don't do a move to do a move. You do a move to develop the fiction. That's all. And if you remember that and you keep coming to that, you will have full control of the game. You will have the fun that everyone at the table wants to do and will not be fighting the system. Even if you don't understand certain moves, even if you're not sure when to come up, if you always ground yourself on the fiction to look for move, and on the fiction when you return from moves, you're gonna be able to sell the game through the first sessions until you learn it. Uh, another very good one is showing the cost of using power to cut corners. Things get very weird, for example, when you lose the power of the void uh, on your personal project, you are inviting weirdness into the city. Uh, things get very weird when you change uh, growing power uh, or when you vent and unleash shadow powers in the real world. So there's always the temptation to avoid a lot of the shit that society throws at you but it never goes well but again because of the valves of the stress that constantly apply you are more and more tempted but you know those comes back to bite you in the ass and worse a lot of times it hurts other people more than you <laughs> uh, another very important one which uh, uh, is especially good when you are portraying your vessel and you're not exactly sure how to, to portray them because you know you created their avatar on the on the shadow their abilities and and what and they also have a face in the city and that's it how the two things connected and this is something that is good to remember and a good principle to go back from. The, the, the vassal is not just, you know, a menial boss of the castle, just a noble in this uh, dark feudalism, just a minion of the void, no. The city and the castle create the vassal. The conjugation of this two flow of energy create the antagonist that you see. We have someone that was created in an exploiter by the structures and hierarchies of late stage capitalism in the city. And that has been offered an opportunity to go beyond the normal venues of exploitation by the castle. And ultimately, what separates uh, this uh, capitalist bourgeois from the rest and what separates them from the mindless minions and enforcers of the castle is exactly the conflict between those so you need to find what really defines them what they want and have these things keep bleeding into their lives both in the city and in their avatars and their domains inside the castle Another thing that is very important is not to just make those targeted by the castle's exploitation just nameless victims, just uh, fodder. Give them passions and drives, and this is pretty easily done if you go into a covenant, but don't over rely too much into the covenant. Give people the passions that they wanted to do, drives, and Keep offering them uh, opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to indulge into them and pursue at them, which will only make it worse when the vessel ruining the city keeps making things worse for everyone. Remember, these are people, they have lives, they also want to make things work for them, 
they just don't have the power of the castle to draw upon but italy they again they are pursuing this they are also in this fight together and uh what is the point of improving the base conditions of the city if it's not to allow more people to fulfill their passions and drives this is what we are fighting for right and going back is go back that covenants must be cultivated with care covenants are not something that you extract value from and just discard people it's something that must be groomed it's uh something that must be tended it's well it's a blo uh, blossoming uh, relationship again these people have passions and drives they have been influenced by the castle in nefarious ways uh, you're not supposed to go there and drink their lives and abuse them even more and, and and any help they give you it's a great sacrifice so that you reciprocate and you cultivate this solidarity is very important and covenant sh should be fully fleshed out and not just another source of power not just you know a good version of the void <laughs> of course then we have the classical uh, the classical uh, powered by the cocklips uh, talk to the rebels not the players uh be a fan of the character so keep putting them in interesting challenges and cheer them on as they fail or they succeed keep letting them explore their story and be flexible with your responsibilities know when, when to delegate don't try to just control the game and make the decision yourself uh know how to listen to the players and uh with the story they want to do with their rebels what changes they want to see in the city in the castle and you know when you doubt you can always delegate that's always a good rule especially when you are learning the game so we have pretty good fundamentals how to keep the stories beating uh uh, another topics that come recurrent on other elements of the game is develop the villains more uh, as by having you know focusing on the enforcers on the house of the castle of the vessels on their personal affectations uh, keep constantly putting pressure on the vessel's clock so use that basically to set the pace of the game it's usually the best way to control uh, the pacing of the game without robbing agency and narrative control from the players let them take the actions that they want to but whenever you want to give some urgency or give them a breather just focus on manipulating the vessel clock and with when that touches with uh, uh, fleshing out to the people on the city is to keep involving the covenants and the people with the, the interactions of the players most often within the city but uh, that's not exclusively exclusively from the custom of course there's a, a thing this is not exactly secret sauce from void heart symphony this is actually uh uh this is actually uh something that uh, uh, Void Heart Symphony got from its prequel, uh, Rhapsody of Blood, uh, which, you know, if this is more like the Persona uh, games, uh, Rhapsody of Blood is more like Castlevania. Uh, but the thing that another secret sauce that this game inherited, and in a way makes even better, is that this game has some of the best boss fights in all the history of role-playing games. I'm not even joking. Uh, the quality system in which you basically define a vessel by the qualities that they have, that then are tied to the castle, and each of those has its own specific moves and you need to create openings to exploit them and you always go back and forth into creating opportunities, openings, putting yourself in danger, suffering blows, 
breaking down qualities and every time you break down a quality the combat changes drastically uh most of the the abilities tied to qualities they really complicate the fight so at the same time you are making progress also the stakes of the combat escalate honestly this and the thing is the game immediately dumps you in a boss fight I, that's part of the procedure of the first session uh, the game is proud of its uh, boss fights and for good reason again they really are the best boss fights ever i mean anyone that has fought a, a difficult monster in most of the role-playing games especially more trad games is familiar to how much of a green they can become but uh, uh, again this dynamic again uh, about uh, openings and exploiting vulnerability keeps getting the combat interesting and uh, rewarding new ways to approach combat and the eternal changing circumstances of the qualities really really put the dressing on the yeah i i i can barely even it's it's really good it's easy to learn uh the the first example of the first session lets you build a vessel in the moment and it's pretty explicit on the, how to handle the fight and the further fights only get better and better so you always have that to look forward for not only you're gonna get the investigation to get a cool fight with the vessel it's really going to be an epic cool as hell fight and you get the reward of a rivers and desert so when they say that the catharsis happens in the castle catharsis really happens in the castle and you can really bring the pain to the vessels and bring payback for what they did to the city again it's that's really when you can go all out so we go hit all the four points we know what we are playing we know that uh, we are playing rebels we are pressured by society limited in what we can do but the castle that empowers our enemies also gives us the mean of our own liberation the engine is pretty solid and has both procedural conversational and uh, uh, meta narrative elements but everything from the scarcity mechanic is reinforce it and you always have the imminent plot of a touch of void the advancing uh, plots of the vessel and the many many projects you can get involved to set the pace we also should consume and consume and consume covenants in evidence and really rejoice on those boss fights and if we keep to the very solid set of principles if we develop both vessels and the covenants in the city and again if we put regulate the pressure of the game by manipulating the vessel clock we're gonna be hitting all those story bits which the game is designed to hit finally what can we take apart from this game imagine i'm never gonna play void heart symphony i'm just appreciating it as a piece of art a pinnacle of design one of the best world of legacy nay pbta games but then what can i take home from this well there's a lot of to take home because they are good of solid systems the labyrinth mechanics on the castle they are something that you can scavenge for something else the stress mechanics you can scavenge for anything which puts in situations to which your character's abilities are not the most important the duality of conflict the all the small systems from advantage disadvantage and so on and so on you have all these small pieces that you can use and learn from uh, and polish design but 
ultimately if you look at all those in the home you realize which is really the trademark uh, design of j isles because as i mentioned at the beginning of the stream uh her games of no not all of her games she's also very good at creating micro rpgs which again we're gonna go full circle into this is the world of legacy games they they are infamous as being quite overwhelming and complex as powered by the apocalypse games go which they are often compared with forged in the dark blades in the dark hacks on that which i think it's a bit fair because everything about forging in the dark is complex because the rules are complex you have a complex resolution mechanic that ties with a lot of fiddly things while words of legacy is a more elegant design the complexity there is a, a kind of complexity that i really appreciate the complexity does not come from intricate complex hard to learn difficult to master rules it comes from very simple self-contained system if we go to the book and any of the books, honestly any of the legacy books we can be overwhelmed by looking at the all but if we focus on one thing we will quickly realize that it's as easy or easier to learn than equivalents on other power by the apocalypse games for example the stress system is way more simpler than to understand they need their similar systems in ironsworth and spire you focus on learning that and you learn that and it's simple the move system is simple advantage and disadvantage are simple things to learn the covenants are very simple the way you interact the health mechanics are very simple the shadow and child mechanics are very simple they're basically an xp system with more steps in between and that you can actually temper in both directions every single system is self-contained as you learn it it's easy to understand the rules to master but then you put it next to the others you can see how they interact and you don't focus into that you move to the next thing you need to learn you learn that simple you to master and it works together nicely before you realize you are playing a very complex game with a lot of moving parts but because you went step by step you mastered very simple element did not overload players at the table took your time you learned how to pull the levers to make the game do with you and it's a very good uh, type of complexity and again really betrays intentional clever design and i think even if you don't do anything else learn at least a legacy game enough so that you can run it and most of these games have very good introduction they can run you through one or two or three sessions just go through interact with small parcels of the game and then you're gonna have a greater appreciation of how to organize a game of this scale building only on very simple blocks and this is a very good lesson to learn as a designer and also a very important lesson to learn early on so that you have an easier time learning the game which again is the entire point of these uh study sessions uh and again this is a game where you focus step by step you can interact only with one element or another slowly the slowly change focus and complementalize the things as you get a further realization of 
how every moving piece hits. You're gonna have you're gonna have an easier time learning, you're gonna enjoy yourself more, and you can focus in listening to your players and accumulate. And I think that's ultimately the big thing to take part is the the beautiful that there is in working with very simple systems, very simple rules, working with redundancy, and instead of focusing and mastering elaborate, elaborate extravagant uh, mechanics and systems and procedures or whatnot, just focus on mastering. 20 or 30 simple systems and putting them together, making sure that they flow harmonious. And I think this is a lesson to take home, both during uh, sessions in which you are overwhelmed, you can just focus on a place and downscale the situation as you compose yourself to design, as when you start designing your own games instead of going immediately for the big complex engine system on revolution uh, and uh, what not focus on step by step on doing small things and then put them together on an actual complete intricate way and when learning games when you start reading a new game instead of you know just going from cover to cover try to break it down in small digestible pieces and I mean, do what we do here. Find out the key critical points, master them, and then take your time and into rest. And yeah, that's our study session with Void Heart Symphony. Uh, again, this is a Ufa Press game by J. Isles, and you can get it on their YouTube page. I recommend it. I recommend it again. And I think great time playing through it. And I have heard final version is gonna be releasing soon. I'll get into it. Right. In this stream, I'm gonna do it. To see you around for another study session. And let's break apart another beautiful game that we're going to be screwing up the next time.